let us kick off straight with our first company, which, uh, as Scott mentioned, is Jade Stone Energy. It's an upstream oil and gas company in the Asia Pacific region. And we're very pleased to welcome Paul Blakely, who is the president and chief. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you very much, Nigel, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, we've been here for uh, over a week now, um, the CFO, Dan Young, and myself, uh, and our investor relations manager, um, uh, marketing and presenting our guidance for 2019. It's the first time we've ever done a guidance, uh, and so it's been a very interesting week. Uh, I think the reception has been strong, but um, um, as we've labored through the week in, in, in freezing cold weather, I have to say, I wasn't prepared for it. Uh, um, um, this evening, something you know, unique has happened. Our, our stock in, in Toronto went up 7%. So, so obviously, you know, despite the whole week in the market, it's, it's being here this evening that obviously makes a difference. Um, so, <laughs> so thank you for you know, whatever you did. Uh, um, um, our origins um, uh, as, a, as a business um, stem from a small exploration co a company called Mitra Energy, which was listed on the Toronto Exchange uh, for several years, uh, operating in the Asia region. Um, uh, the, um, the, the management uh, uh, very focused on, on exploration and shareholders looking for cash flow decided a change was necessary and brought in myself and some of my colleagues who are ex-Talisman Energy. And for those of you who know uh, the North Sea sector well or, or um, you know, elsewhere in the upstream segment, uh, Talisman Energy was um, an upstream uh, E&P company that really focused on acquiring and exploiting, producing and undeveloped assets. Uh, not necessarily an explorer, but more an acquirer of second phase uh, activity. And I, I spent 10 years in the North Sea uh, building out the Talisman business, and we became a very significant operator uh, here in the UK, uh, and then moved to Asia to, to do the same thing. And in 2015, um, Talisman was acquired uh, um, by Repsol, the Spanish uh, company, and uh, we decided that Asia still had lots of opportunities and our strategy was, uh, was, was sound and, and although not quite unique, uh, was, not a, you know, was not a common strategy in Asia uh, and we felt that we were well positioned to carry on and so we were looking for a vehicle uh, to, to keep going with, with an acquire and exploit strategy and, and so we took on the Mitra platform uh, rebranded to Jade Stone to, to get away from the exploration image because uh, I'm not an explorer uh, and the team are not either. And, and our story is very much moving away from uh, the idea that, uh, 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 that we, we want to invest in the significant geological risk associated with exploration uh, and also to uh, spend uh, the amount of time it takes to turn an exploration success into production and cash flow. Um, um, you, you, know, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to, to, participate, to participate in a business that, that has uh, you know, that amount of, of time associated with monetization. And, and so rather than that, we've adopted um, uh, really the, 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 the talisman uh, philosophy uh, and uh, in launching Jade Stone in 2016, still listed on the Toronto Exchange, uh, we went about uh, acquiring some producing assets, uh, an old oil field uh, on the uh, uh, northwest shelf of Australia called Stag. Um, we also acquired a, a small producing asset, actually Legacy Talisman in Indonesia, uh, to build out the portfolio in Asia. Uh, and, uh, and we have a legacy uh, undeveloped gas development in Vietnam. So. You know, if you look on a, on a very small globe, they all look pretty close together, but, but we do fly seven hours from you know, one end of the business to the other. Um, to investors here, we say Asia Pacific, it's pretty simple and you know, trust us, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's all gonna be fine. 
uh, on the ground. E each area does have differences. But we bring the, a, a, a sort of you know, a common purpose wherever we are, wh which is looking to acquire assets where you know, we can buy them cheap if possible, but more importantly, they have significant reinvestment uh, opportunities. And so you know, the value we create through the actions we take is where we differentiate ourselves from others. And there's no point just buying barrels. Uh, and so you know, closing an asset deal is important but it's what you do the day afterwards that actually makes a difference. And I'll, I'll, and I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I'm not going to use the slides here. You've got uh, copies in front of you, and I'm not going to, to talk to all the slides. What we've provided is, is I think, you know, some information that gives you a sense of, uh, of, of how we go about the, the story. And so, you know, it, slide four in, in your pack, which actually is titled Right Team, Right Place, Right Time, really speaks to the principle that uh, the talisman experience, w which is 20 years of doing this, we've acquired probably 30 or 40 producing fields over the piece. And at the end of our 10 years in the North Sea, for example, Talisman was the second largest operator in the North Sea behind only BP, producing about 170,000 BUEs a day. So it was a big business, but it was all done without the exploration drill bit through acquiring assets from the majors and others. Um, the place we'll call Asia-Pacific, and you know, our perspective here is, broadly speaking, the Asian economies are, are still growing economies, uh, and throughout the cycles over the last 10 years, we still see Asia as being at the heart of global growth. Um, we uh, see in each country rising energy demand and a shortfall of energy supply. So pricing is strong, which is a pretty important part of the equation, both for gas for local consumption, but also liquids, which sell generally at premiums. Uh, and, and so that you know, is, is a first very important part of the, the story for us. Uh, the second part of the story is access to opportunity. Uh, and um, rather like the North Sea, for those of you who have you know, followed the evolution of, of, of the North Sea and other maturing basins, what typically happens is the, the majors are the new entrants. They take the largest risk and therefore generally the largest reward. Ultimately, though, um, uh, their patience runs out. Uh, um, the opportunities become less material and their investment thesis starts to, to, to move elsewhere. And that's when second phase operators come in, smaller companies, more nimble, quicker, simpler process, uh, and, uh, and with a focus on second phase activity. Uh, that was certainly Talisman's growth in the North Sea, uh, and that's our view and what, uh, what Jade Stone is now doing in Asia Pacific. And so we, we have the, the team who's done this you know, many times, you know, we're in an, we're in an, in an area where, uh, where we see lots of opportunity and, and, uh, and Asia Pacific is now reaching that level of maturity like the North Sea was 20 years ago. Uh, and so we think it's a great time and we're starting to see the majors getting restless uh, and, <coughs> and delivering up assets. And, and, and our thesis was to create a company that could become a credible counterparty in, in transacting with the majors and taking on, on this, these kinds of assets. And so the timing we feel is absolutely right. And you know, there's a lot of data from Woodmac and other sort of independent sources that confirm you know, growing maturity in the, in the basins in Asia, uh, uh, less investment from the majors, uh, more assets coming to the market. So we feel we're perfectly placed. And so as I've outlined, and, and we have some details on slide eight in, in the presentation, when we talk about uh, our strategy, it, it is absolutely to take on assets which have a lot more investment potential beyond what we see on day one. And, and so um, what we're looking for is multiple levers of reinvestment option. Uh, for example, you know, we want to see our, an ability to reduce operating costs, perhaps improve uptime performance on the asset, uh, drill infill wells and change the recovery factor. Uh, but other things too, there's often commercial opportunity that may be little exploration, and we call that little e as opposed to big E. And little e 
is low risk and follows on from production and captures the near field small remaining potential. Uh, and then there may be uh, you know, an ability for the infrastructure to capture third party streams as well. And so when we see assets that, that carry all of those opportunities, uh, that, that's perfect for our strategy. On, uh, on slide nine, we talk about the portfolio that we've started to build out uh, as Jadestone. Uh, it, it started with the acquisition of the small stag field offshore West Australia, as, as I touched on, uh, but also uh, um, in Ogang Komering in Sumatra, Indonesia, uh, and then finally as a legacy asset, the undeveloped uh, gas discoveries in Vietnam. Uh, and, uh, and then earlier last year, um, we uh, looking to grow the business and to grow materiality, we... Um, we looked at, an, at a new uh, field in Australia called Montara. Now, Montara produced at around 8,000 barrels a day. It was being sold by the Thai National Oil Company, PTTEP, who've had a, an unsuccessful uh, operation there. And in that lack of success, we saw huge opportunity for us. Uh, and so um, we settled a deal in the summer and closed uh, late September uh, with the Montara field, and we're going through the typical process of transfer of operatorship right now. Uh, but Montara is the classic asset for us. It, it has you know, lots of low-hanging fruit, lots of things we can do. We're already taking costs out. We're planning to drill our first infill well uh, and numerous well interventions that we'll carry out with a program uh, uh, during the next quarter. Um, the, the other, there are other great features to Montara that may be hidden from, uh, um, from others' view of the asset. Uh, um, it, it comes with you know, huge tax pools, uh, and so it makes it probably you know, the lowest taxed uh, upstream opportunity in the whole of Southeast Asia uh, because it carries $3 billion of unutilized tax, and so will only ever pay a corporate tax of 30% whereas ordinarily assets will, will capture other taxes, petroleum taxes and so on. So, so that makes all of our investments even more valuable, uh, given that profits, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we retain 70% of all the upside. Um, in acquiring Montara, we, um, we took the opportunity to move to London, uh, and we listed on the AIM exchange uh, in, in August of last year, uh, through uh, an equity raise of $110 million solely for the purpose of funding the acquisition. Uh, we had great support from our banks. The, uh, the raise was oversubscribed, uh, and we were delighted with the outcome. Uh, and in doing so, picked up some, some great uh, new investors and broadened the, the, the uh, shareholder base significantly. Uh, and uh, investors in our stock today uh, uh, from that raise are, are companies like uh, Miton, Fidelity, uh, Bailey Gifford, um, um, and many others whose names I can't remember. <laughs> um, so so um, it, it's, it's the, the stock's well held, um, but we certainly want to, su to support the idea of retail investors uh, playing in the stock too, uh, and, and hence why, you, you know, we're, we're delighted to to come and, and, and talk in forum like this to, to broaden the story and, and to widen the, the understanding about, about Jadestown. Uh, and so um, on slide 10, we, we uh, describe Montara. I'm not going to go into any details. I've sort of touched on it. It, 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 it consists of an FPSO that, that we own as part of the acquisition, a small platform with wells and, and some subsea wells, and all of that creates you know, lots of opportunity and cost reduction and further activity. Um, and, and then on slide 12, we, we'll, we provide you a description of the stag oil field. Uh, it, it's, um, it's relatively small, but has you know, a lot of barrels. Uh, it's a low energy reservoir, and so you know, it comes out of the ground slowly, only produces at around 3,000 barrels a day, but it's free cash flow positive, and it will deliver barrels probably for the next uh, 15 years or so. So uh, in that sense, it's a great underlying asset to the business, pays all the bills and more, uh, and uh, we're delighted to, to have it. It, it. it was also 
useful because it, it allowed us to present our credentials as an operator. In Australia, the regulator is tough. It's, it, it's, a, it's a regime that's, that's like the North Sea. Uh, and to be credited as an offshore operator really helps you, you know, us to, to chase other assets. And in fact, was probably pivotal in succeeding to acquire Montara um, um, subsequently. Um, so having those credentials demonstrating you've got the capability and the process and so on in place was, was, was a, an important part uh, of the STAG asset. And then on sli slide 13, we, um, we talk about the Southwest Vietnam gas development. As I say, this was the one thing that was in the legacy Mitra platform that, that we, we backed into that we kept. Uh, it's well known to, to us at Talisman, ex-Talisman, because it's adjacent to a very large Talisman producing asset uh, just to the south. Um, the interesting thing about this gas, there's over half a TCF of discovered resource, uh, but we can move very quickly to develop about 200 BCF uh, into a, a nearby existing pipeline infrastructure that feeds a power station in southern Vietnam. And so the development is, uh, is moving along on, on track. We're in a pre-feed, and we hope to sanction the project later this year. It adds uh, material growth in production, cash flow, and value. And so far, it's on track. And whilst I can tell you, you know, in some of the countries that we operate in uh, across Asia, uh, whilst there's often you know, uncertainties uh, um, with respect to you know, government approvals and processes, which are sometimes quite opaque, you know, in the case of, uh, of this development, it's going to feed an existing power station that is moving short of gas. The, 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 the supply today is in decline, and so we'll backfill, and it means we're seeing you know, really strong support from the Vietnamese government to get this project uh, on stream. Uh, and so that gives us a lot of encouragement in both the commercial terms that will be struck uh, and their support to the development as a whole. So, so in that sense, you know, you know this is, a, 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 and we have a long history, in, I have to tell you, in, in, in talisman of operating in Vietnam, but this feels like uh, you know, you know, the most, you know, most comfortable and open process I've ever experienced there. Um, on slide 14 in your deck, we provide what we've been showing the market for the past week, which is our guidance for the year. Uh, um, you know, last year, Jadestone was producing around three and a half to four and a half thousand barrels a day. This, uh, this coming uh, year, we're, uh, we're saying 13 and a half to 15 and a half. So it's a material change to our business, and that's thanks to Montara. Um, but the other thing about our guidance is for the first time, you know, we're delivering a significant uh, capital program on top of the acquisition. We'll be drilling the first well at the, at the, at the Stag field uh, for over six years. I mean, we've, o we've operated it only for the last year and a half, uh, but it'll be the first well for six years, and we're excited about that. The rig's moving now. Uh, should add 1,000 barrels a day and change the, the whole cost profile of Stag. So, so that's an exciting uh, step forward for, for the Stag field. Um, a lot of the capital is on Montara. Uh, we, we plan a well towards the end of the year, uh, and uh, that well should, should come on stream at around 3,000 barrels, which is great for 2020. Uh, but in 2019, we've got, in, we've got uh, interventions into existing wells, installation of gas lift, and a variety of, of, of other things that, again, is designed to lift production by about 3,000 barrels a day. So there's a lot going on. And, and the, final, you know, the final thing for, for the year is we'll shoot a, a new seismic survey across the Montara license because we do see you know, a lot more potential there. Uh, and so you, you know, overall, um, the guidance, uh, if, you were to, if you were to take our average operating cost of uh, 21 to $24 a barrel, think about an oil price today of around $65 a barrel. Uh, uh, you know, include all of the, the uh, what we'll call the major spend, mostly capital, uh, of around 120, uh, and set against the production volumes, uh, we'll be able to carry out all of this capital activity and we'll still have uh, around $100 million of free cash left 
Uh, and so, you know, it's amazing how quick in, in acquiring, producing cash flowing assets, the, the flywheel of cash flow generation really spins up fast. Uh, and with Montara, uh, um, we, you know, we've, we've really accelerated the, uh, the cash generation story. And uh, whilst we uh, took out um, um, a uh, reserve base uh, loan at, in support of Montara as well, you know, we'll materially pay that down this year uh, um, and still have free, cap, free, uh, free cash left. And so looking forward into 2021, uh, we can, we can uh, develop uh, the Vietnam assets all within our existing cash flow deliver growth to 30,000 barrels a day without having to come back to the market. So, so far, the story is working really well. There's a lot of hard work goes into operating mature assets, I have to say. There's a lot of skills that are required, and we pull quite a bit of that experience from the North Sea. Uh, and, um, and a lot of, it, a lot of the, the people that are involved in the asset have, have been doing this for you know, 20 or more years. Uh, and that's, a, that's pretty important. Um, so um, having um, delivered so far to the story and we're able to speak this week to investors and, and say, you know, remember what we told you last summer? Well, you know, it's still the same, which is a relief. Um, nonetheless, you know, if you turn to slide 16, uh, Jade Stone remains a very compelling investment because the market recognition is definitely not there yet. And so what we show is a, a, a 2p value uh, uh, that is twice, more than twice our current trading value. Uh, and, and that excludes even the, the development in Vietnam. And so the conclusion that we, you know, we've come to is, you know, with a new kid on the block on the, on the AIM exchange, uh, um, we, um, um, we need to prove that Montara cash flows are real. When we acquired the asset last summer uh, for about 70% of the 1P reserves, the market was suspicious. This is too good to be true. Uh, and so we have to show the market, I think, over the next couple of quarters that that is not the case. Uh, and production recently has, I think, already started to signal uh, that the asset is high quality. Um, and, uh, and with progress towards the development in Vietnam, you know, we're hoping the, uh, the recognition from the market will come over the course of 2019. If not, we'll just have to buy our shares back. But, you know, as an alternative, we'd be more than happy if you were to buy the shares instead. So, you know, I, I think, I think we're, on, you know, we're on the right track. I, I think we've set ourselves up well for the future. Uh, you know, we, we're waiting for Shell and Exxon and, and Chevron and so on to start bringing assets to the market, just like they're doing in the North Sea, uh, and we're positioned to uh, to take full advantage of that. So, with that, thank you very, thank much, you very Paul. much, everybody, and happy to take questions. Well, that was <laughs> round of applause. That was exactly your allotted time of 20 minutes, so here's a man who meets his deadlines, excellent. which is excellent. Uh, who's got a question for Paul? Uh, we've got one right at the front here. Just bring the mic over. Um, okay, uh, this is a brief question to Paul. Uh, my name is Mark uh, from Mark. Genesis Oil. Okay. Um, uh, coming from a chemical engineering background, um, I think you made um, a point about uh, one of the assets that you took over from from the uh, was it the Vietnam? Um, I think I think it was the it was the government that relinquished that that particular field, or uh, because they weren't having much. Montara, you're talking yeah, about? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So what what? Um, what sort of gave you that confidence that um, you you would take it over by using a different approach to to sort of uh, be, because coming from obviously because mm. um, we we sort of deal with assets where depending on how you how you drill and also the orientation you take you can recover a certain amount of volume mm -hmm. where say 
another operator would not have actually acquired that. So I just wanted to know what sort of uh, approach or confidence that you sort of uh, took that made you go for that, okay. where they did not want to uh, proceed. Okay. So a question around, you know, how, how you know, where, where, why are we confident that we can take a different path to, to others? Use the microphone. Sorry, yeah. sorry, beg your pardon. Uh, so, uh, so the question around, what, you know, why we have confidence to take a different path than the others, previous operators and so on, in, in the way we, you know, we take an asset forward. I, I, I mean, the first thing I would say is, is, you know, one reason is because we have a lot of experience of doing it. I mean, you know, Jade Stone is a very young company. And our portfolio is still quite small, but if uh, you, you know, the, but the team, and I, I think there is a slide in here. You, you know, it, it's you know the management team is 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 talisman energy, and we've been doing this for 20 years. You know, don't ask me to drill an exploration well, or you know, develop an LNG terminal, or you know, we 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 stick to our knitting. We're, we're good at. Uh, that's a very niche skill set, which is taking assets from, from majors and from others and transforming them. And, and that's all we've done for you know, a very long time. And so for that reason, you know, we have a lot of confidence. No two assets are the same. And so you have to take a completely fresh approach when you look at an opportunity. Uh, whilst it's interesting to look at the seller's view of his own asset, my experience is you know, it's, um, you, you know, it's not a good data point. Uh, um, it, you know, it's a fixed view that may have been held for years. It stopped, you know, challenging the way uh, an asset could be, you, you know, developed differently. Uh, and so from the bottom up, we build our own view about the potential. But you can understand investor scepticism because in many cases these are major companies and they have decided this isn't working. So they're, they're wanting to get rid of it. I mean, if it was so great, why would they be making the asset available? Good. Thank you, Nigel. We get, <laughs> let's cut right to it. <laughs> um, um, so in 1995, Talisman started in the North Sea uh, as a venture, as a second phase operator, and we acquired the Beatrice, Buchan and Clyde fields from BP. You know, tired assets that had, on average, a remaining life of two years. The Beatrice field was looking forward to 12 months more production before, it, uh, before cessation of production and abandonment. Uh, uh, Buchan was four years, and I, I can't remember. But so on average, it was two to three years between the three fields. Um, 20 years later, all three fields were still in production. And it's not because BP can't do it. It's because they're not interested in doing it. And the whole point about BP is... And, and, and this is a really interesting, specific example, and, and there are many others, but, but the point about these three assets is BP even recognized in their maturity that they had to operate them differently. They hived them off into a separate group called the MAST assets, the Mature Assets Team, and they set them up outside of the main BP hierarchy. They even put them in a little dirty old Nissan hut at the back of the main BP terminal uh, 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 office to signal, you know, we're different, we're low cost. A and and they, they removed all of the corporate overhead, BP overhead, and they said, we're going to do a great job here. And they took 30% operating costs out of the assets in doing this and felt that it achieved a great outcome. We took them on and 12 months later, we took another 30 percent out of their operating costs because we just don't have those processes. You have to be far simpler, cleaner. You need to do the important things, but there's a whole lot that corporations do that absolutely add no value, and that's just how it is. Um, but the most important thing that made the difference was capital investment. And if you don't invest in the assets, you don't really change very much. Taking another 30 percent operating costs might have eked out another couple of years of production but you have to invest. And the problem with the mast assets in BP is they still had to go back to the mothership and compete for capital. And these assets and the opportunities are small. And in BP's scale of activity, they just didn't compete for capital. And so that's why it's not, you know, it's not because BP, well, it is actually because BP can't. I mean, you know, they're just not set up. Large companies are not set up to do small things. Anyway, so great, great question. It. Thank you so, very much for leaving that question. You. Who else? Yes, one just in the row behind. 
thank you, Paul, for great presentation. My name is Dmitry, and uh, uh, you mentioned that market is not there yet in terms of recognition of true value of the company. And uh, if market doesn't start recognizing this year, you do share buyback. What are the major factors why you think market is not recognizing? Is it geography because it's too far and there are no peers which uh, create the story? And uh, uh, what is your plan? How you are going to address those uh, misunderstanding of the market and to eliminate this discount, which currently obviously exists from what you've presented? Thank you. Thank you. You and I need to chat because I think you've got all the answers. Uh, <laughs> no, he's um, got questions. <laughs> <laughs> because you're right. I mean, the, you know, the recognition, in part, we are a long way away. That, that's true. Uh, um, in part because, you know, on the, on the AIM exchange and in the small cap EMP space, there are a lot of names that are working in Africa, North Africa, West Africa. There are a lot of names that are working in South America, and there are a lot of companies that are in East Europe and so on. There are very few in Asia. So, so you know, the, the, the story about the opportunity, the regional opportunity, the big opportunity, isn't heard very often here, I think. And we need to do more of that. And, you know, whilst we'll, wel we'll welcome some competition, not too much, please. Um, so, so that's for sure a, a factor. But as I said earlier, you know, for me, primarily it's because we're new. And whilst, you know, individually, personally, we may have a track record, the company doesn't and we need to. And so I think the market is waiting to see, you know, Montara performance over the next couple of quarters uh, and us delivering a gas project in Vietnam. One more quick question from anybody? Yes, uh, over there. Thanks. Hello, again. Um, Hi. Your Montara well coming up later in the year, uh, what kind of chance of success have you got on that working out as you hope? And I've got another one. Um, any lifespan on Montara? Have you, you said stags about 15 years? Okay, okay, thanks. Um, so the infill well, it's the first infill well that we'll have drilled on Montara. Um, we've, we've selected the easiest location, the most obvious location. It's within, you know, I mean, the seismic's very clear, clear and clean on, on, on the main field. Um, we run reservoir simulation and you can see quite clearly reserves that will be left behind. So. You know, the chance of success is very, very high. There's very little to no geological risk. There is well control around it. And we use data extensively to understand it. And, you know, the advantage of buying a producing asset is there's lots of data. And so we use that extensively. And, I, I, you know, I, I have uh, very high expectations. And it's never 100%, but it's pretty close to, to, uh, uh, to, to being a certainty. Uh, in terms of field life on Montara, um, we project on our 2P reserves around 2031, 32. We have already identified some infill locations that are not part of our 2P reserves, so maybe 2035. And actually, we have a lot of gas, uh, and we have given no value to the gas. Actually, the Montara field is an oil rim under a very large gas cap. There's no gas infrastructure in the area we assume no value. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Shell announced the development of a nearby gas field called Crux, and they're looking for, for, uh, for gas into their infrastructure. I, I think this is great for us. It'll add value and extend field life further. Thank you. Paul, thank you very much indeed.